welcome to our dad on the Jim Crespin Podcast. Welcome to the Jim Crespin Podcast. My guest today, Samantha Picard, publicist to the stars and founder of Strut Entertainment. Good to see your face, my friend. Oh, it's so good to see you too. It's so lovely to always get to see your face in person or through the screen. So you're a very extroverted individual. Obviously, people are going to pick <laughs> that up during this podcast. It must have been hell for you the last 16 months. <sighs> to be honest, it was kind of a treat. <laughs> okay, and I expound say that. on that. Well, Jim, you know, like I have my fabulous four girls working with me and I have 10 to 12 clients a month and I have the media and there's a lot of noise. Every single day, there's a lot of noise, a lot of communication. And I've actually found a little bit of peace during this time during COVID just to actually regroup with myself, to have some time for me, even though I'm very much still communicating, you know, on a daily basis on phone calls and Zooms and Hangouts. Um I found, I found a lot of enjoyment out of this downtime and it's also helped me regroup as an entrepreneur, which I really love. Um, but yeah, there's definitely been those times, you know me very well, you know, I'm extremely extroverted. I'm very social. I've really missed connecting with my industry friends and my personal friends, missed my family terribly, as you can imagine, because they're in Australia. And I've absolutely missed the connection with the artists and the media and being able to do what we do best, which is take them out show them around town, do the proper networking to help them build their careers. So that's that's been a real downer for us as publicists and marketers has been not being able to take some of the newer artists around in person and really help them with their networking being built. And, and sorry, just back to Australia. So your family is there. What part of Australia do they reside in? Um, a little town near Byron Bay. So on the north coast, above okay. Sydney and below Brisbane. And what the hell is going on in Australia right now? Depending on what news service you watch or independent <laughs> journalists, it's like it seems like it's a bit of a mess in Victoria right now. Um, but I'd love to get the take from someone who is in constant contact with people who yeah. are on the ground. Well, from what I, the gist that I can get is that they sort of waited and watched what happened with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of countries that did that to some success. And New Zealand and Australia had great success doing that um, until they didn't. <laughs> and, um, I believe Australia manufactures uh, their own AstraZeneca. They have like an actual factory that does that. But because of the stories that came out about, what was it, eight people got blood clots blood, yeah, and died blood clots, yeah. in the whole world. Way less than anybody who ever uh, took a birth yeah. control pill. But let's not talk about That's that. That's right. Yeah, I don't know the exact numbers, so I might be a bit wrong. But I do know for a fact that like a lot of Aussies were very standoffish. And so a lot of their vaccines went to other countries that really needed them at the time. I think Brazil, Indonesia, India. Um, and then they got a reality check when they had the outbreak. And so now, now they went from, I think, like 8% double vaxxed three months ago to 60% double vaxxed. So the Aussies are moving fast now. They're just a little slower than us. Yeah, well, fair enough. I mean, they're, they're spread out geographically. And, yeah. you know, I think um, I, I empathize with people who have healthy levels of skepticism for the government or the so-called experts at times because it's <laughs> like uh, really easy for them to continually mismanage pandemics and or economic issues and, you know, the list goes on and or healthcare, And then you know, sort of turn it back on the citizens and blame them. But the reality is, uh, you know, the, the, the data seems to show that if you haven't had COVID, um, that, that your best bet is to get vaccinated so you have some semblance of immunity when it does get you, because it's going to get you. This sucker is transferable, oh. it's transmissible, oh, and it yeah. is highly contagious. It is coming for yeah. all of us, vaccinated or not. So Yeah, um, I agree. I really agree with you. And, you know, it brings up an interesting point, Jim, and I'm sure you've experienced this. I've had conversations with my talent who don't want to get vaccinated. And, you know, I didn't want to get vaccinated. I have lupus. I am on a completely naturopathic regime. I have never taken steroids. I've never taken drugs for lupus. Um, I've never had a flu shot. I didn't want the vaccine. I got it straight away because... For me, with my immune system, I had to. And then the other part is if I want to do my job as an industry professional with people like you, I have to be vaccinated. And this has come up a lot, particularly with our West Coast artists, um, Alberta-based artists, um, a lot of family values that don't believe in vaccinations. And being on a call like this recently with one of my emerging artists who's a brilliant singer-songwriter and having to look her in the face and go, you realise if you don't get vaccinated, you're never welcome to come to Toronto 
and be able to do those in-person closed door meetings because you're not vaccinated. You won't mm-hmm. be able to get on a plane. You won't be able to get on a train. You won't be able to get on a boat. <laughs> you're going to have to drive. And then the decision has to be made about whether or not an industry person will even meet with you because you're not vaccinated. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in Canada, we have six months of the year is cold. We're indoors in heated rooms. And from a professional standpoint, opportunities for young artists and any artist in our worlds that don't get vaccinated are going to be few and far between. I don't disagree with anything you said. I think that in order to have a fair discussion to convince people who are skeptical, you have to empathize with their perspective. Definitely. And, um, and so, you know, there, there's a, there's a bunch of things in this that, that personally I've been able to sort of think about and process as well with clients um, who are in the same boat. And it's like, number one, we should be holding uh, the experts and the drug companies to a higher level of standard for their product. Now, I understand that they put this thing together, these vaccines, in a very truncated timeline, <laughs> and they had to be very reactive. But we should have been messaging from the get-go that these are not a cure. These are not a magic fucking pill for you. And just because you're vaccinated doesn't mean that you're ironclad against COVID, right? You no, don't no. have... You don't have uh, perfect protection. And and I think that would have been helpful. And then I think had we been a little bit softer and a little less coercive and a little less shame driven in our messaging to, you know, because that often gets people's back up, you know. Oh, 100%. To, to just educate and, 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 and not educate from a place of condescension, but from a place of, hey, listen, let me hear all your concerns and then let's go through them one by one rather than telling you that you can't participate or that, you know, a room full of vaccinated people should feel threatened by one un- unvaccinated. Like that doesn't even make sense logically. And I agree. <laughs> no, that it doesn't make sense. sense. <laughs> it's like, well, that doesn't make sense. You're all protected. So, <laughs> so it's, it's finding a way to connect with people's true fears and their narratives, and then either helping them dispel those with new information or data Rather than, you know, making them feel like, well, listen, if you don't participate, then you're, you're dirty, diseased, and I don't want to be anywhere near you, you know, because that just just gets people's back up, right? And just Well, and you and I, you and I are the conduits, like I'm the conduit for the media. So, you know, most media right now are not inviting, not having anybody in their studios, even some of their Mm. staff until spring next year. So we're a conduit. So when someone says, oh, you know, I want to be pitched to be on breakfast television, or I want to be pitched to be on CBCQ or in the Sirius XM studios. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, that could be done remotely, but if you're not vaccinated, you have to show proof of vaccine and you have to, sometimes when we go in next year, we'll have to have the test. The scrape studio. That's right. Before we go, you've got to show an actual negative test before you go in. So there's a whole bunch of protocols, and I'm sure you're the same with your venues. Um, you and I are definitely the conduit for messaging people um, mm. about what their limitations are going to be if they're not vaccinated. And that's just part of doing business. And, you know, I think that everyone should have their own choice. At the end of the day, what you put in your body is up to you, whether you put, Certainly you know, should be. seaweed in your body or the contraception pill whatever it is that you eat or put in your body is up to you um this particular situation has consequences that will probably impact decisions i think and i think that's been one of the hardest thing to reconcile with people who are not wanting to get the vaccine is that the consequences that herd immunity that's happening and and sort of like you know, to your point, um, there's a little bit of under the thumb, people being pushed around and sort of saying, yeah. you've got to do it or being shamed. Um, that's going to be real. I think that's going to be psychologically tough on a lot of people. Yeah. And, and I'm not sure it's fair because we're not talking about all of the other holistic benefits of the things that we can do outside of the vaccine. And that that's been yeah. one of my most frustrating challenges as it pertains to our political leaders. It's like mask up, contact tracing and vaccines. It's like, okay, How about in addition to that, drink your water, eat your vegetables and break a fucking sweat once a day. That that last one, your immune system, that last one, especially if you've got a strong respiratory system, especially you're better off, like you're better able to fight it. hundred percent. The data is irrefutable. We're not talking about that because that's a hard conversation to have because we want to conflate that with fat shaming or some other bullshit trope. But it's like, yeah, it is not shaming to coach or encourage people to have a better life for them 
right? Absolutely. It's not selfish for me to say, you know, hey, listen, in order to feel more protected around you, yes, it'd be great if you were vaccinated, but also it would it'd be great for you if you had a better quality of life. And here are some things, that, some quick adjustments that you could make uh, in terms of diet or in terms of exercise regime that would fortify your immune system, but also improve your life, your energy and everything else about you, right? Like we have just lost the ability to sort of like talk about that right now. And that's why it's important to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations that we can share yeah. with the world and, and people can tune in and get from it what they want. And, you know, I'm, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I've been vaccinated my whole life. I haven't gotten this particular vaccine yet because yep. I got COVID and um, I tested negative after four days. And other than losing my sense of taste and smell, which oh. it's hilarious what tipped me off is my wife ordered Indian food and I was like, that is weird that I can't taste or smell this. I would, and I, I would have died. <laughs> I had cold like <laughs> symptoms, but uh, I spent extra time in my home sauna, which again, I invest in thousands a month in supplements and I have a home gym yeah. and I have a sauna. I have these proactive measures that I put in place. I'm not boasting about it. It's just COVID wasn't a big deal. So will I get the vaccine? Yeah. Ultimately I'll have to. But am I going to yeah. wait for a while to see if there's more discussion and data around uh, the efficacy of the vaccine along with natural immunity? Yes, I'm going to do that because it is my body. It is my choice. And ultimately, I have to live with those consequences. And I think oh, that 100%. coming at it from that angle has really helped lower the guard of a lot of people who are... Uh, you know, might fall in the anti-vax camp, but I've been able to have those like, hey, listen, I'm not vaccinated either, but here's why. And if, and I'm not afraid of the vaccine. I'm also not afraid of COVID, but, but that's because of 30 years of proactive work on my <laughs> yeah. health, right? Absolutely. And I think, and, um, I think too, Jim, that's a testament to the way we all live our lifestyles. Also, you live a wonderful outdoor lifestyle, like your, your nature the backdrop of your nature wonderland where you live is incredible. Like it makes me miss home, to be honest, whenever I see you posting your Instagram photos. That's the one thing that I do miss about being a city mouse now. You know, I've been a city yes. mouse for 33 years, left my little one horse town when I was 16 to work in the music business. But um, I spend a lot of time at Riverdale Farms. I don't know if you know that two kilometres from my house, there's an actual hobby farm with horses and pigs and goats. And it's um, in a little village called Cabbage Town that overlooks the Don Valley Parkway. So that has been my COVID stress release and also my physical activity. I go to Riverdale Farms every day. I climb the hills. I walk the stairs. I so pet the great pigs. for you. I yeah. Pet the pigs. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you get exposed you know? to animals and dander and, and all of those things that fortify your system, you know, oh, yeah. in, including fresh air, vitamin D. And yeah, I, again, uh, I think you can you can possess the belief that vaccines and modern medicine are are a blessing and they're a great thing and thank God for innovation. But you can also say there's there are tactics and strategies that we have used effective as human beings, effectively as human beings for thousands of years, and we know the data is ironclad around those. So let's also take a more holistic approach to this and um, and yeah, hopefully. Hopefully we'll start seeing more of that being messaged. And I think that, you know, in, in British Columbia, where we are 87% vaccinated and a lot of people who aren't are in my position where they had COVID. So they have the natural immunity, which according to the latest study out of Israel and science.org means that you're seven to 13 times uh, better protected than someone who's double vaccinated. So it's like, we're still having a crisis in our healthcare. So that means mm -hmm. that the vaccine isn't fixing all our problems and that for once in our life, we don't get to turn to the blessings of innovation and a magic pill to cure our problem for us. So to me, I think COVID is maybe the perfect problem that society needed to be presented with in order for all of us to face our vulnerabilities, not just with our health, but also yep. with our businesses, right? Oh, yeah. And we've all been very vulnerable, I think, from a business standpoint. It's been... um. It's been pretty jarring to see some of our friends and peers in the industry um, be really, really impacted by this. I know you've been touched by it a lot as well. So have I. Um, I was excited by the challenge, the old Pepsi challenge, as they say. I was very lucky to have started. I started my marketing division over two years ago. So maybe six months or four months before COVID hit, I'd already started changing my business model. 
And I kind of, I, I really felt it was a bit of a gift, as I mentioned earlier, to have that time where COVID shut us down because it really allowed me to move through the paces of switching gears and continuing to grow my marketing business faster than I would have been able to if we were fully functional. So there was, as you say, that sort of silver lining. I, you know, I've had a lot of negativity around being locked down in the pandemic and a lot of heartache, not being able to go home to a mother who's not well. But from a business standpoint, I did take that on as a challenge. And last year we had our best year ever in 15 years, but it was not without a lot of work. It's been a blessing for so many businesses because you're right. We, at least speaking for myself, I get caught up in the hamster wheel and it's like, uh, I'm very proactive with many things in, in my life, but, uh, this business has a, a level of urgency to it that sometimes yeah. makes it feel very reactive and things do change. And, you know, so you end up sort of putting out a lot of fires rather than sort of sitting back and planning and strategizing as to what you want to do. And I think yeah. that's an inevitability for anybody who has multiple clients in this business. But what COVID did is it gave us a chance to get off the hamster wheel, take a breath and go, okay, what kind of a company do I want to have? What kind of a life do I want to have? And how do I integrate those two things so that I've got maybe not no regrets, but less regrets when I'm 85 years old, right? And and I think artists have been given this time as well to explore that same uh, dimension creatively to go, what kind of a career do I want? What do I want to be remembered for? You know, what am I going to do with this time I've been afforded now to hone my craft, to maybe add new dynamics to my my music and my art and to engage my audience uh, through this strange time, right? We came up with the drive-in show concept, which yep. had been done in Europe successfully. We're, we just happened to be the first ones who did it in Canada with uh, Brad Kissel and we did over 50 of those last summer. We're still doing them now. I can't believe it. We just had a drive in last weekend. So do you need a nap? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's busy. My workload is, is down. I mean, it's, yeah. it's less revenue, uh, but it's busier, but that's great. I've been able to focus on my label and some other things. Uh, but more what I need is I need to see a return to normalcy because as much as I've enjoyed um, innovating with drive in shows, it's, it's a proxy. It's not the real thing. No. It's not the same, you it's know, and, and, and it works. It's a temporary band aid measure and I get it keeps people safe, but there is nothing like thousands of people singing back the lyrics of an album cut to an artist and me standing side stage and watching that beautiful exchange of energy between the headliner or, or the opening act in some cases and that audience and I'm sure you feel the same way when you attend live oh, yeah. shows where it's just like, oh, yeah. wow, these people are all escaping their problems for the next hour and a half. And I get to be part of that. I get to be part incredible. of something that fortifies their mental health, their emotional health. And in, in very divisive times, which we've seen lately, there's a real yeah. air of, of unity at these concerts. I definitely, I, just um, love. I, I definitely feel like we all have missed that let live getting sweat on your face from a whole bunch of strangers and the lead singer <laughs> situation. And I, the other thing I want to say to you, and I, I would love to hear your perspective on this is, you know, there was a lot of people saying, Oh, did you see how many people separated or got divorced during COVID? Well, on our side of the business, what I saw um, outside of personal, personal affairs and, and relationships was that that thing you said about it had the artists stop and think about their careers one of the things that really gave people an eye opening from the creative community was that some of them were extremely, extremely reliant on live music income only, and they didn't have other revenue streams. Their business model wasn't well-rounded. And that's been one of the sort of critical things that we did in the first six months was we had to deal with a lot of that anguish coming at us. They couldn't necessarily talk to their manager at the time. They didn't feel comfortable talking to the label, talking to their agent. But they realize it's like, oh, my God, I've been in this band. We've been chart toppers, been doing it 15, 20 years. But 90% of our income comes from live revenue and merchandise sales. They don't have streaming revenue. They don't have brand partnership and endorsement revenue. They don't have revenue from any other area. And that was a real shock to a lot of talent and actually has changed a lot of their business models. And some of them have changed their teams, which was my point about the divorces and the separations. Some of that's come between talent and management and talent and labels because, 
they're with teams that don't actually look at that big picture on how they can have a well-rounded income model for their music career. And it was one of those random things that I kind of never thought about because I don't really have to at the moment, you know, or at that moment. But when COVID hit, it's like, oh, wow, yeah. If you're a rock band who's a live touring act and that's where your money comes from, COVID would have been horrendous for you. So it's been um, it's been interesting how it's impacted the different souls that you and I work with and the creatives that we work with um, and how they've changed their business models just like you and I had to change our business models. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think um, – I think we're, you're such a master at the pitch. And uh, so I want to give our viewers and our listeners an opportunity for you to pitch strut and, and <laughs> publicity firms in general, because I've, I've always believed that um, in the composition of the team of an artist, uh, long before you need an agent or a manager, you need a good radio slash DSP tracker and you need a publicist. You need someone who can help steward you to create some demand in the marketplace so that an agent can swoop in and, and help you leverage those opportunities, right? And, and drive yep. up your, your price point and your profile. So I've always been a big fan of, listen, if you're, if you're a major artist, you need a publicist. But if you're just starting out, it's not a bad investment to get a publicist on board early. And would you echo that? Absolutely, if your music's ready. <laughs> I hate saying that because everyone thinks their music's ready. Um, it is now more important than ever for emerging talent to have some sort of media footprint. So, you know, you and I working together over the last 10, 12 years that we've known each other, how publicity has changed, the media landscape's changed, what you and I would have done together with a, an album release 12 years ago is nothing like what we would do today with an album release because... You know, we've lost, what, 3,000 people in media have lost their jobs in the last 10 years in Canada. We've lost 35 newspapers in Ontario alone. I can't even tell you how much the industry has changed when it comes to media and what media we have available to us. Um, but at the same time, too, it's but been some of that media podcasts. Is, yeah, I was going to say it's been replaced through other media. It's mediums. been replaced, yeah, by the podcasters, by incredible bloggers, online magazines, which has been wonderful. The biggest thing is the perception, Jim. Everybody wants print. They want the newspaper. They want the magazine. They want radio. They want television. So those things come into the equation at a certain point. There's less opportunities for those now because of the pandemic, um, unfortunately. So we've definitely seen a decline in, like I've got Grammy and Juno winners who can't get on some of the national television shows anymore. And that's pretty jarring to a, a music um, artist that's been, you know, been lauded their whole career on television and now it's hard to get them a national spot. There's just no bandwidth. Um, yeah, and it ties into a lot of things. You know, the other thing that was really interesting to me that I've really learnt the last three years that I've, I'm sort of proud of, like, I remember when I could get your artist on Breakfast Television Toronto or CP24 in Toronto and I would guarantee that we'd sell you another 30% 30, 30, 30 of your tickets on that day for the day of show. That used to be what media did for us, especially television and radio when it came to, like, conversion. I always go into PR now and, and tell people, listen, you won't sell an extra ticket. You may not even do a stream with all the media we're going to get you. But what we're going to do is give you, you know, 15 interviews, 20 interviews or features or reviews, maybe 30, that you can then as an emerging artist use to give to your grant writer because all the grant applications, all of the things mm -hmm. that they need to do to support themselves to pitch, like when they're out there pitching festivals by themselves because they don't have a Jim Cressman in their life, the first things that the grants – need and the festival buyers and the concert promoters need is well what have you done like I don't know who you are your songs are awesome your live video looks incredible but what have you done show me what media you've done what radio have you done so I've realized that while we're not we're not necessarily doing the same function and giving the same gifts we used to give as publicists we're definitely giving another gift in the new world and that is helping people get to the next step of their career it's just it just looks different now you know it really does um, and we've got to be I've always been very discerning about what type of talent my staff and I took on we've really got to love it and believe in it and it doesn't matter if I don't like personally like the genre it's about is this a good song can I sell it Jim all we do all day is sell that's what a publicist does we are sales people there's no big gift around it except can you sell and can I sell this music that you're giving me to pitch so for me it's we're being a little bit more discerning about what we take on but I mean we take on 16 year olds out of their parents bedroom 
who've got incredible music and an incredible producer and mixer and supportive creative team, just like we take on, you know, acts like Chase Rice, for example, who we absolutely love, of course, um, or any of the other established artists that we work with. So for me, the way that publicity has changed has been jarring but exciting um, and you have to be honest with people, Jim. Like I kind of I see a lot of ostriches out there where there's a lot of publicists out there that want to sell the sell but not be honest about the results. And you just have, you have to tell your clients, hey, we're getting great traction here but we're getting no's over here and this is why. They're going to find out eventually. <laughs> well, the truth is undefeated. Right. And this is a this is a results driven industry. It doesn't matter what side of the desk you sit on, whether you're a publicist, agent, manager, if you are not uh, providing your client with the right ROI, it will catch up with you. And the way to mitigate that, to echo your point, is to manage expectations right out of the gate, you know, and, yep. and I've always done that as well as a manager and agent. It's like, here's what I think I can do for you. Here's what I think is beyond your reach. Now, I need to know. I need to know what your perception as my client is of you winning. Because yeah. if you winning is you performing on the Grammys next year when you haven't released a single yet, then I'm going to lose. Right? <laughs> exactly. Right. And, and I mean, that's, that's sort of a straw man, but, but there no, are people yeah. with crazy expectations, you know, like well, I mean, 100%, including of, us. Yeah, Include, including but, you and I. That's how we we've done what we've done. <laughs> but you want to uh, you want to make sure that you're articulating what you actually can do and get done for them, so that they don't feel yeah. disappointed in the long run, and and manage those expectations as you work through processes. So, yeah, no, I understand the validity of that. So, when when have you ever had a situation with a client where, for one reason or another, maybe you communicated everything properly? But for some reason or another, they were disappointed. And then how do you pivot to sort of get them back to realizing and appreciating the, the value that you do bring to the table beyond what they believe they should be entitled to? Uh, what does that conversation look like for you typically? Wow. It looks so different every single time. It really depends on the artist, where they're coming from, what their experience is. But there must is, be some consistencies. There is. There is. Yeah. And the consistency is I'm always surprised when we – we think we've outperformed like we've outperformed on a project and the talent is still really disappointed. And I'm like, you're an unsigned unknown artist. We got you 32 interviews for a single on a four week publicity campaign and you're unhappy. <laughs> I just sit there thinking to myself, Oh my gosh, if only you knew about the other artists that we also worked in a different genre at the same time. And we got them 12 things only and they were so grateful they would have given us their firstborn child. Yeah. So quite often I find it's um, we straight out of the gate have all those conversations up front. Like we actually we talk to them and go, you're not going to be on Entertainment Tonight Canada with this. We're not even going to pitch it. So we mm. actually part of the strategy of us pitching and before we even go to contract, when I have those first calls or meetings when it's pre-COVID, um, we just talk, I just talk that through and I'll go, this is a single campaign. This is the kind of media we're going for because of where you're at in your career and we need to build. And that's one of the, that's one of the conversations I like to have early around avoiding disappointment because building an artist's career is like building a house gym. You have to put the foundations in when it comes to your media outreach. You've got to build a relationship with the media, put the ground posts in, put the floor in, put the walls up. Like, and I take them through that step of understanding what it means to build a brand and build a career career in the media and also build relationships in the media. So we try and have a lot of those conversations right up front before a proposal is even submitted because if we don't, we tend to have more of that concern coming through. But we also talk to our clients. Like our clients are on calls or video hangs with us or on emails with us almost every day or every other day. And so we check in with them. And I straight up, me and my girls, we straight up will get on the phone with someone and say, okay, guess what? We're here in crickets, which means no media, but all we can hear are the birds and the crickets. So we need to have a conversation. This isn't working. We're two weeks into a one-month campaign. It's not working. And then I talk to them. And if they've got a team, talk to their team. And we look at what else we could be doing. We need to switch gears. They're not resonating with the music. They're not resonating with the pitch materials. What else can we give? So, and I would imagine your filters have become more honed over the years so that you can sort of predict if that's going to happen 
uh, before you even get rolling or take a, a client on, which is imperative. I'm not a big believer in this demonization of millennials. I mean, I think that it's actually quite a awful narrative since, um, uh, we are the generation that potentially could have been more helpful in mentoring them along the way to give them the tactics and strategies necessary to produce success. But I have found that, and again, this is not an indictment. It's just a reality, but with the conditioning of quick rises to fame through, uh, it started with American idol. Right. Yeah. And then it, it, it transitioned into social media and now it's into TikTok. Yeah. that and, and then you couple that with the convenience that we've all or the, the addiction to convenience that we've all become accustomed to in society at all our ages right including me yeah. and it sort of created this mindset of entitlement that really needs to be confronted in a loving way with the idea that there's dignity in hard work, there's dignity in in digging in and doing the unglorious shit that actually yep. moves your career forward, right? And so those have always been awkward conversations for me, you know, where I don't want to be like, ah, you know, you're entitled and you're crazy and your expectations. It's more like I understand why you look at this artist who isn't one tenth as talented as you, but has 80 million TikTok views and you're pissed off. Yep. But at the end of the day, that is not how legacy careers are built. You know, I mean, I'm not sure that if Tom Petty came out today, he would break on TikTok, but he would probably still over the next two to three decades, build a legacy career. Yeah. So do you find that that's something that you're encountering with the younger generation as well, where it's like, you know, you want to sort of encourage them and remind them like, Hey, listen, I know we live in a shortcut society and we're all victims of that, but Mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of shortcuts in this business. I mean, there are exceptions. Sometimes somebody wins the proverbial lottery, but by and large, it's intensity and consistency, great product, hard work, showing up for those interviews in the right headspace, like the basics. Having a plan. I think um, having a plan is so important. You know, working with artists and letting them know it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, And, you know, I told you I'm 33 years into my career and every single day I wake up and I'm learning something new and I have to start at the beginning as well, just like those emerging artists or the emerging career like professionals, people who are going to be you and I in the next 30 years who are now 20, 25, 28, 30. Um, I tell them it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You're in, if you're a musician, you have to commit to a five, 10 and 15 year plan for you to get where you want to be and for you to actually make a living and retire from music. However, that looks for you. And the eyeballs that go out of their head when I say that, especially to my youngsters who are 17 to 25 year old artists who, to your point, you know, they do get sucked into that social media sort of tunnel of looking at what else everyone is doing I like to call it rubbernecking because they're constantly rubbernecking around to see what everyone else is doing instead of focusing on what they should be doing that's really important and I think the other part to this outside of just the talent and you and I deal with mentoring young people in the music business who want to come in as professionals and do great work at the label level or the agency level or at the publishing level wherever it may be Um, the support just hasn't been there. I do a lot of mentoring and you know, the most jarring answer to the question that I ask when I ask 20 up and coming marketing or communicational professionals who are, you know, early twenties going through schooling and I've been brought in as the guest speaker. I ask them who advocates for you at home and I get a blank stare and someone who's not too nervous will put up their hand and go, what do you mean? I'll be like, Who supports your dreams to become a communicator in the arts or sports? Because they're typically the the groups that are brought in to talk to me, arts, music, entertainment, sports. And I'll go through the whole crowd and everybody will be like, well, it's just me. And I'll be like, well, what about your parents? Well, they don't care what I do. Like, well, do they support your career? No. Or what about your siblings? No. No. Who advocates for you? Who do you go to when you want to tell them about your dreams about becoming a music industry or an entertainment industry professional? Everybody except maybe two people in that room will just say they don't have any support at home. And it's, you know how upsetting that is to me to hear that? 
the, the people who always come back to me, it's always a grandparent or an older sibling. So who supported Most of them, you? Oh, my parents for sure. They're also the crazies that got me into music at a very, very young age. <laughs> but it is depressing to me to hear that. You know, and I know that my generation is responsible for that because I'm in my late 40s and my peers who are in their late 40s now have 20 and 25-year-old children and, you know, some are a bit younger than that. And I think about my generation and sort of how we haven't done enough. We haven't done enough to support the next generation of leaders coming through. That's kind of depressing. And a lot of the kids, a lot of the artists and a lot of the industry professionals who are coming through the young stages, they're supported by their nuclear family, by their friends at university or by their peer groups. They're not necessarily getting the kind of support at home that I got. I'm sure you got some support at home as well. Um, thank God for parents who believe in our crazy dreams. They, my parents weren't happy that I wanted to leave school at 16 and run away to Sydney that was 10 hours away. But they're like, well, we can't stop you, so we may as well drive you, you know. That kind of support, you don't realise it at the time. That's mm -hmm. huge. It's definitely huge. But that's, I'm glad you bring that point up. I think that that is a message that can resonate with other industry professionals to help close that gap, right? Like yep. those of us who are in the business to go, you know, as we are speaking to new industry people, new artists, we also have to potentially assume the role as their only supporter for their dreams, right? Yeah. And remember that. And, uh, but there's a dichotomy to it where at the end of the day, you are the one running your race. And yep. if you are uh, inoculated, uh, using that, good, good if, if you're inoculated by the doubt of others and the ability to turn failure into uh, ability, the ability to learn and acquire more knowledge, that can be a huge success too. Like a lot of breakthrough stories of people who do actually rise to the top. It's like nobody believed in them. In fact, a lot of people were against, you know, my particular case, my parents were not down for me having a career in the music industry. They thought that I was sort of uh, sustaining um, my teenage years, you know, by, oh. <laughs> by, by just enjoying my, but, but, they listen they, they had my best interests at heart and that's what i had to realize and and come to at some point um so that i could dispel with the um the resentment right yeah it was like definitely you guys were doing the best for me that you knew you didn't see what i could see and i think a lot of entrepreneurs artists uh, people like yourself in the business industry professionals i think that that they do feel that sometimes it's like I'm the only one who has my back ultimately. And so as much as I agree with the point you're making, I do agree that at times not having anyone in your corner can actually make you a better fighter and it oh, can make 100%. you even more resilient. Yeah. I 100% I agree with that. And I also think not having the means, like we grew up so poor, you know, and I can't imagine what went through my, particularly my father's mind um, when I, as a 16-year-old surfer girl, went to Sydney to work with all the druggy and drinky music industry folk. You know, I was mm -hmm. 16. That's a, that's, a very different, um, that's a very different pill to swallow when you're a father. It's a different pillow to swallow when you're a mother. Um, and we were so poor. My parents didn't have the means. You know, we had, we had the means to get me there, and I had to start work immediately doing restaurant jobs to actually support myself while I tried to get into the music business. And I think not having the means as well, really, really fuels you as an entrepreneur to pull yourself up from your bootstraps and make a go of it. And I think you also have to find some resilience regarding the shit that's going to fly at you. Like I often like to tell people I'm Teflon. You just. Right. But, <laughs> but part of the reason you're Teflon is because you had to burn your bridges early yeah. on oh, yeah. and you had to succeed. <laughs> We, we, some of us have, but a lot of people still want that safety net, right? And it's like sometimes you have to just relinquish that and let go and and chase your dreams with, you know, not with delusion because there's there's a difference between determination and delusion. And, and determination means you have something that you're chasing and other people also see that you're amazing at it and you know deep down that you are. Delusion is... You know, and, and this is where having sometimes almost too much soft support around you can actually work against Ooh. you is that your mom yeah. has told you from, 
day one that you're better than Taylor Swift and your aunt has told you that and your grandma told you that and your friends all told you that and nobody told you that you don't write songs one one hundredth as good as Taylor Swift was when she was at your same age, right? And you needed that person who, who is a bit more tough love, a little bit more like a coach to go, hey, listen, I actually want you to get better. I'm not just <laughs> propping you up for the sake of it. And so I am going to tell you what I observe and how you can overcome these um, these potential uh, vulnerabilities and, and how you're actually going to be better. And that is something, that's a message that has to be delivered with a lot of heart, a lot of empathy. And uh, I find if you want to do it successfully, it's got to be delivered with love. And they have to feel the intent that you want them to be better, that you oh, want yeah. them to succeed. And that the only reason you're pointing out their vulnerabilities is not to hurt their feelings or to make them feel unloved or, or unsupported. It's because you want the best for them. And if they can feel that, generally, they'll take your advice. And they also, Jim, um, you know, I think you and I know that if they don't take that on, they're going to go to five more versions of you and me, our peers out there, who are going to be a little bit more scalpel-like in cutting them off at the knees and sending them out the door. So they're going to get the same message by and large. You know, if you're tone deaf and you want to record music, we're going to have a problem, <laughs> especially mm -hmm. if, want to, if you want to sing live. Unless um, you're Yoko Ono. Yeah, exactly. Then you're okay. <laughs> or, or Linda McCartney. I think Linda McCartney might have been a little <laughs> off there too. But I think um, I think that I always say to a lot of the artists, I have artists that come to me that are horrendous, horrendous. And, you know, you have to really look at their strengths and really help them with um, the areas that they desperately need help with. I find the hardest thing, do you want to know the funniest thing? The hardest thing I find is it's less about what your performance is. It's less about your voice. It's less about that people get really offended when you tell them they need better songs and they're, they, they pride themselves on being a songwriter. Like getting a bit of support from the community and collaborating to become a better songwriter I think is such a gift. You get to build your network, you get to meet other people who become your cheerleaders and make you better. But I find that's where we get the resistance, where, where people think, God, you have the audacity, you don't write songs, you have the audacity to tell me my songs aren't good enough. And it's like, well, they're kind of not. And I'm not like an expert in music overall. I know what I like. But I, I know a good song when I hear it. Yeah, but you are an expert. You've been in this business for 33 <laughs> years. And, and you're a consumer, right? And you're still a music True. fan. So Absolutely. You know, yeah. if, if you don't resonate with the product on any level, um, and, and again, like I think that I think that can be dangerous as an industry person. I've often said you need to be able to disconnect your personal biases from a yeah. project and go, yep. Is this marketable to your demographic? If your demographic is a 21-year-old female and you play that song for me, I personally may not get it, but I can understand how to market it and I can understand oh, yeah. how to get it to your audience. And I can anticipate to some degree successfully as to whether or not it's going to resonate with that audience based on what else is resonating um, or sometimes just a gut feel. But um, but yeah, that 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 is something that is important is like we need critical feedback to grow and yeah. um i'm so grateful that uh a lot of the people i've worked with over the years have a background in athletics or in sports because that's where there's true meritocracy right and you yeah. can have somebody who encourages you all day long in whatever sport or athletic pursuit you have but unless they're going hey these are the six things you are doing right but here are the four things you need to work on if you really want to step up your game. Well, then you're ignorant to it, right? And we need more people yeah. like that in the arts. So I'm glad you're out there fighting that good fight because those people who are horrendous may not become exceptional, but they could get good. And sometimes oh, yeah. good is just enough to scrape out a living in Canada. <laughs> you know, like yeah. where we have so much support for the arts. And uh and, and listen, what's good to some people might actually end up being exceptional to others. Yeah, and I think um, I think one of the most exciting things for me is watching somebody who, you know, does, well, they might initially crumble with some of the feedback that you give them, even if it is given in a very, very kind and sincere way. But watching them rally, watching them rally and see that light bulb go off, and literally I have people come to me at least 10 times a year that come back to me three months, a year, two years, going, I took what you and then I'll name two other industry people said to heart 
And I went out and I worked on all these things and they'll come back with the most unbelievable project or they'll come back with like an unbelievable performance that they're just 10 times better than what they were. And I'm so proud of them from going out there, taking those really hard, hard bits of feedback on and going, I'm going to use those, you know? And I think I've always, I've always been that kind of person too. I've, I've had some seriously hard knocks in the business, especially being female, being a loud mouth, foul talking Australian. You know, I talk too fast. I move too fast. I do stuff too fast. I'm this, I'm that. Um, I'm very grateful that I like who I am because it's very hard to cop constant criticism as you're coming through your career as an artist or an industry person um, if you don't have a little bit of a tough exterior and the ability to filter stuff in. Jim, if you come to me with criticism, I'll always listen because I respect the crap out of you. But there's a couple of other people out there, if they come to me with criticism, I might be like, hmm, next. You know, I always go to those people that I trust to be honest with me, real with me, and people who I admire. Um, and I try to always remember that when I'm giving advice to people who've asked for it, whether it's a peer, whether it's a young person coming up in the business or an artist or an actor. Um, I try to be that person for them as well because, oh, man, it's it's tough out there. There's a there's a lot of people who are really ready to fire at you. you well, and, and, and part of the journey of maturation is developing your discernment. And, yeah. uh, and that is so critical, especially for artists. It's like you know the difference between a critic and a coach, you know, yeah. and once you start to develop that, or, or like you just espoused as an industry person, then you know if someone's coming to you with advice, it's not because they want to hurt your feelings, it's because they want to help you. And and then there are people who just want to take you down and you know who they are too. And then you can yep. start to discern that within your heart a little bit and go, well, this person is just having a fucking bad day and they're an asshole at the best of times. And this other person, I actually respect that person. And and if they've brought something to my attention, maybe there's some validity to it. And I've got some, I've got some things I need to confront about myself, right? And yeah, and that can Constantly. be uncomfortable. But it's it's not once you develop that skill of discernment, it's uh, it's easier to figure out who's coming at you just because they're jealous or whatever, <laughs> and who's coming at you to actually help you out. Now let's talk a little bit about stunts in the business and i'm going to put you on uh the spot a little bit because through the 60s 70s 80s and even into the 90s um publicity stunts were a big thing to garner I attention yeah, yeah. For, for, uh, but nowadays they don't happen as much but but they happen differently i would imagine so let's talk about some successful publicity stunts that either either you have borne witness to as an industry colleague and went that was smart, or that you have instigated with your own clients over the years. So cite some examples so people can kind of get an idea and get their own wheels turning on what might work for them. Well, I think the biggest thing to sort of say up front is that it's so heartbreaking to me as a publicist and a marketer that no one seems to have a budget anymore to do anything really cool, or if they don't have a budget, they don't necessarily like some of the, um, you know, some of those kind of hatchet, hatchet together, patch it together kind of, you know, quick and simple things that can be quite in, impactful even if they look a bit cheap and cheerful. So it's been a long time since we've done anything kind of remotely stunt worthy. Um, we've found that our successes have come from curating really special events, which are more, they've been more impactful for us. You know, one of the, <laughs> this is so stupid. I shouldn't say it's stupid because I love them. This is, this is like so basic. It's stupid, but we did the Rolling Stones publicity for the 50-year anniversary tour. So we did um, the show in Toronto and a show in another market. And um, we wanted to do something. with We didn't have access to the band in advance of the announcement. You know, they're in England. They're not doing media. So we were chatting to the promoter and just talking about, like, what could we do? It ended up being a person in a gorilla suit. That was the stunt. What is it, 100 bucks? You rent a, rent a suit. Yeah. We did a camera call for um, Young and Dundas Square. We had the news cameras come down. Didn't tell them what it was for. We just told them. I think they had a bit of an idea. We gave them like a little teaser. I can't remember what we wrote, but it was kind of like a brain teaser. And we had three news cameras turn up from three different from three different outlets um, and three different broadcasters, I should say, come and actually cover a monkey in a suit to announce the Rolling Stones tour. <laughs> 
you know, if you can't get a celebrity, a you can get someone dressed up as something that uh, will garner attention. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that was one of those ones where it was like, we're all like, oh my God, it's so tacky. We can't do it. And it's like, well, why not? And it got agreed upon. Like it went up the, it went up the chain, came back down, got agreed upon because we didn't have anybody else. And so basically it was um, one of those ridiculously cheap and cheerful things that actually was quite impactful and got us on the news. Every I think we're on the 6 o'clock news across three different broadcasters, which was fantastic. And, of course, the announcement came later on that day. So that was one of the really fun things that we did. But it's been, for us, honestly, stunts have been almost non-existent because you got to remember when we started, Jim, um, the first eight years of my business, um, we were doing really indie projects. We didn't have any of the major labels outsourcing to us. We weren't working with a ton of celebrity acts. We weren't even working with acts with big budgets. We got those acts through the touring side of things. We were hired as a tour publicist typically to work those projects. Um, but it was definitely more on the event side, like coming up with really great event ideas, um, inviting very very select media, very select tastemakers, industry people to do some really fun events. You know, we've done things like we've taken over the CN Tower. We've done, we've done like you, we've done gigs in barns with leather good companies for some of our country artists. We've curated like sit-down personal dinners with artists where we've incorporated brands. We've done lots of different things and quite often we've done $50,000 event, $50, events with $5,000 budgets. Um so I wish I had something more exciting to give you on that side. I mean, I'm sure you've done some pretty awesome things too with some of your tour announcements. <laughs> well, I would like to get your opinion on the uh, the reality of clickbaiting and um, how sometimes these days, especially uh, politically incorrect messages or messages that are purposefully inflammatory are used to garner attention. Of course, we just saw Dave Chappelle just dropped a new comedy special, right, on Netflix. Yep. Oh, yeah. And um, and the sentiment, if you actually weren't offended and could spend the time to watch the entire special, was actually quite inclusive. And, uh, of course, he's got his, his Dave Chappelle uh, observations and uh, his sense of humor, which I find uh, intellectually stimulating and uh, admirable. But... Um, but he also created a bunch of controversy and that controversy helped drive eyeballs to the special. And, uh, so that, that has sort of like replaced what would have been in some ways, maybe more clever stunts through the 1960s, 70s and 80s into like, what could we do to just piss everybody off and then drop a project on the back end of it, garner a bunch of attention. And, uh, what do you think of that trend? Well, I think it can be extremely successful um, and I'm finding it happens more with high profile people, as you and I both know, like it, it tends to happen with the big sports superstars, the big entertainers. Um, and it, it amazes me to your point, like there's a whole one hour of this amazing story, but that 60 seconds or 90 seconds where people pull out that audio or pull out that video and then they use that as the narrative to, in this case, you know, have the, the negative, the negative click. <laughs> <laughs> right, or, or hijacking um, important social justice movements, right? Yeah, absolutely. Which, which a lot of a lot. people accused uh, Colin Kaepernick of doing, right, when he started taking in a knee during the anthem. But right or wrong, he ended up getting a Nike deal out of it. He ended up getting yeah. a contract renewal out of it. I mean, I haven't kept up with him lately and all of the um, uh, gossip around him, but I don't know how he's doing now. But you know, whether he was honorably intentioned or not, I think is something that he only knows, but uh, it did work. And you know what? It keeps people like me really busy. I remember kicking it old school. I remember when, um, I, as you know, I did publicity and events for Perez Hilton. Perez was the original celebrity blogger and he was completely unfiltered. I mean, you know, Perez was, he was hardcore. I used to follow he went, him. He was a shit disturber. He he's still so is. funny. He went after everybody. And I mean, I adore him. He's probably one of the most one of the most genuine, sincere humans I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And I've known him for 15 years. And so those first sort of five years of strut where we would have him come and do his one night in Toronto after the Much Music Awards parties were so much fun. And and as you said, he's a little inflammatory. <laughs> so with him, um, I part of the when things would blow up, 
you know, if he happened to be here when something blew up, then I'd be the one getting all the questions and then would he be available for media and you'd see how it would take off more organically. This was well before we had the online footprint that we have now. And I'll never forget. Do you remember that year he, he got punched by one of the Black Eyed Peas? Do you remember that? It was uh, like, oh, my God. I don't off the top of my head, but I think that's uh, awesome. Yeah, he he Was it Will to- I Am? Uh, I can't even remember who it was. It might have been Will, actually. I, I honestly can't remember. I just remember at 1 a.m. I get a call from the drummer from the Black Eyed Peas, who I actually also work with on his instrument side of his career. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's, like, telling me what's going on. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I, I literally had just gotten home and then I'm I'm calling. I'm trying to call Perez and I'm, like, to tell him, don't go on social media, don't talk about this. And within half an hour, it's all over everywhere. He's busted about that now and the old school way we would have to try and put out fires versus now I I wouldn't even get a warning it would just be out on social and I would wake up and find out about it and it wouldn't like now there's no way the fire hose is just it's just out there going at least back you know 10 years ago 15 years ago I had an opportunity to turn the faucet off to some degree and do some sort of media control damage by limiting who he spoke to or who he was exposed to, even though he popped it on. His, I think it was his Facebook that he popped it on. Um, but now forget it, forget it. Something happens and I hate saying it, but it goes viral. And now it's just like, well, let's just watch the shit storm come. And mm-hmm. then we have to make a plan and a strategy to support that. Or sometimes it's not a shit storm to your point. Sometimes it's something cool and it just happens to blow up because of a movement or because your particular artist is right there at the right time doing great things. And then all of a sudden you have, you have a career, a real career out of it. And that's exciting. I think that's very exciting. Nicki Minaj just took a lot of flack over her. um, uh, What I thought was, you know, somewhat of a a corrupted stance on the vaccine uh, controversy, but also Uh, A message that I think resonated with lots of people where she said, hey, listen, like, you know, you should research this if you're putting it into your body, you shouldn't feel peer pressure. And um, but she also talked about her cousin's boyfriend, I believe, and his ball swelling up allegedly, which. Oh, that was funny. Yeah. Yeah. Not exactly uh, scientific, but uh, anecdotal. Anyway, nonetheless, um, she got a lot of attention from that. And are you. Are you finding that the net effect, just using that as an example, or your prediction, do you think that'll be positive or negative for her overall? Because she did get a lot of buzz and was trending for about a week over that story. Every single person that I heard from and who talked about that, a lot of people brought that up. They thought it was really funny. They thought it was really funny. Like they, like, I don't know if that'll be super negative. I'm sure her publicist would like to say something different, but like a lot of people thought that was funny. I mean, anytime you put a ball sack in the, in the conversation, it's pretty funny. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> Unless you're talking about testicular cancer, it should be all laughs with the ball yes. sack. Yes, but, exactly. Uh, and in her case, yeah, just the, the swelling of it was pretty, it was pretty funny. Just that, that I think if you remove that, cause that was the hum to me, that was the humorous side going, what? Like to your yeah. point, scientific. I don't think so. <laughs> It was uh, it was pretty funny. But, I mean, she's always been out there and had controversy in her career. I think that's kind of who she is. She's not really the girl next door, you know. She's not going to be the girl who just settles down and lives a cutesy life. And, you know, when we see her, it's because she's got flowers in her hair and she's hanging out by the pool. It's 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 always going to be a little edgy with her. Yeah, and she um, she says what's on her mind. And to some degree I find that, to use the word that we – uh, threw around earlier authenticated right it's like mm-hmm. and it's not always going to be pretty like the thing about being who you are is that sometimes that is going to rub people the wrong way especially if you're a celebrity you have millions of people on your every word and every photo that you're posting it's like it's not always going to uh, resonate positively with everyone and you just have to be prepared for that. But God bless the people who are willing to go out there and say what they want to say, even if they're wrong. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm not one of these people who's like, you know, I'm a, I'm a free speech advocate and that I think that there are laws that, that need to um, uh, be upheld as it pertains to inciting violence. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. And there are some practicalities and responsibilities that we all have. And it's kind of like driving. 
It's like we all agree that we're all going to drive, even though it actually is quite dangerous. But <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna put on seat belts and we're gonna adhere to speed limits. But we're all going to drive, even though hundreds of thousands of people die per year driving, yep. right? And take people with them that that are innocent victims. Um, we're not going to drive drunk. Like we've established some rules. I think sp- free speech sort of needs that, like that broad base of of ideas that can be discussed with some consequences and judgment. But as soon as we start shutting it down or deplatforming, um, just because we don't agree, like it's one thing if they're inciting violence, of course, or you know, calling out specific racial or or religious groups or um, any oppressed group. But it's another thing if somebody just espouses a bad idea every now and then, <laughs> right? And, and, and finding some levity in it rather than taking it so seriously. I think that that's, that's something that we need to sort of like message along with, hey, listen, yeah, free speech is great, but you're going to hear some crazy shit. You know, like yeah. that's just part and parcel, right? If we oh, have definitely. a free society... You're going to have Alex Jones out there saying what he says, right? <laughs> you're going to have flat earthers and you're going to have yeah. people who, who, who don't believe in the efficacy of the vaccine. And what you need to do is you need to listen to the people that you find the most educational and interesting. And then you need to derive your own conclusions from that. So the deplatforming thing is interesting. And I'd like to get your take on that. Like, you haven't had an artist probably get thrown in Twitter jail or anything like that in the last few no, years? No, not at all. And I think um, went to your point of, you know, being who you are, that comes out. That comes out in, with a lot of creatives. <laughs> like, and that's why we love them because they're unique and they be who they are. Um, but we haven't had, no, we haven't had hardly any of that. Most of the time that anyone's sort of been locked out of their social accounts is because they forgot their password. <laughs> <laughs> or or they tried um you know they tried to do something stupid with their platforms you know migrating one over to the other it's really basic housekeeping stuff for our talent even our big talent when that happens um but i think you know i'd love to talk a little bit more about that going back to who you are i um i don't think you have to be famous to to be authentic or to also check yourself with being who you are like I recognized early on that I wasn't for everybody. I know that you felt the same way at some point, Jim, and probably still do, you know, the way that we are and what we stand for and how we live our lives and work our careers is very personal. And the reason we've been successful in the various ways that we have is because of who we are and why we're different. Like people go to you because they resonate with who you are as a worker, your work ethic's incredible, your connections, your creativity and your loyalty to the people you work with. Um, if someone's looking for somebody who's not that, they're not going to go to you. You know what I mean? And I think that being, you have to, I have to teach that a lot with my, my staff and my talent. And I think about that myself, eventually who you are comes out. So you have to find a way to put that into your career and into your personal life so that you can be who you are with the consideration of others. (laughs) Um, And that's something I've always had to be mindful of because I am a larger than life personality and I'm the kind of person who does get in your face and I've got lots of ideas and I'm very energetic and that energy coming at people sometimes can be a little much and others eat it up with a spoon and want to be around me all the time. But it's it's a prerequisite for your industry. Publicists have to be extroverted. They have to be creative. They have to be boisterous. You know, like, I'm sorry, but I I think... If I had a publicist who was very shrewish and and passive and quiet, uh, it would concern me about how they're representing the product in the marketplace, right? I think you have oh, yeah. to be a talker. And, You've got to be um, bullish too. Got to yeah, be bullish. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So I think that's the mark of the the reality that you found the right profession, and um, the industry is better yeah. with you in it. And uh, glad to have you as a colleague and glad to have worked with you on so many successful projects over the years. And so glad to have you on the podcast too. Thanks for taking the time to do this. It was so much fun. Thank you for having me. Truly my pleasure. We'll, um, We'll see you hopefully sooner than later. Absolutely. Can't wait.